Hello, and welcome to another episode of Solipsis Watched. I'm your host, the Social Solipsist, and this week I watched Chinatown from 1974. Uh, so I was in the mood for sort of a mystery uh, film of some kind this week. I've actually been feeling it for uh, about a month now, but um, I wanted to get around to it, and I was uh, looking at what was in my in my collection, what was available, and uh, realized this was one of those ones that gets talked about a lot, but uh, I've never actually gotten around to seeing. Part of that is that it's a mystery, you know, the, it's the kind of thing you have to be in a certain mood for, and also that it's not a short one either. Um, clocking in well over, well, is it well over two hours? Let me check myself before I say that. Uh, it's a bit over two hours, so it's not an entirely small investment either. And what's with, uh, um, practical real life considerations these days, it's been a little harder to watch stuff that's extra long. Um, <laughs> I say extra long, but it's like half an hour longer than, you know, a completely, An anyway, I'm digressing. Um, <clears throat> Chinatown is a film that people talk about quite a lot in terms of, um, this sort of in-between period in mystery um, mystery content, both in terms of cinematic history and um, like setting history. This is a um, this is a historical fiction piece, essentially made in made in seventy four, but um, set in the thirties, I think, uh, and is has there's a lot to unpack there uh, alone as far as what the movie represents i think i'm not going to delve too deep into that but the short kind of version is that um it fits into a place where we have a lot of other mystery stuff being both produced in film in the 70s and 80s um, and a lot of other mystery media that is set in the 30s. However, this is very, I think, unique in both aspects because of the, the combination of things that's going on. Um, a lot of the mysteries, especially that we've, we've talked about um, before, the, the ABC mysteries and the Poirot stuff, those sorts of things... Um, while they they stray into uh, you know the 1900s and so on, they are uh, and being some of the most visible um, mystery things uh, for quite a long time in media. Um, they are primarily focused on they and a lot of their compatriots are focused primarily on the uh, sort of social elites um, and the wealthy and often not um, American. This, by comparison, is a profoundly American story to the point of sort of being um, debatable in its historicity um, that some people have uh, implied some level of like real history, revisionist history kind of thing, um, applying to how the how, uh, Southern California was developed in the um, you know in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, and that's a whole rabbit hole we could go down talking about um, civil engineering and civil design and um, land grabbing and water rights and all these other things. Those are some fascinating topics to me at least, um, but I'm going to avoid delving too far into them. Um, what is interesting to me is that this is a this is a setting that is much more focused on, um, I'm not going to say a uniquely American perspective, but a particularly American perspective and time and place, as well as being less focused um, or less uh, congratulatory. That's not quite the right word, but um, it is less focused on a uh, white collar or upper class kind of thing and has a lot more certainly in the subtext but also in the the primary text to do with um everyday working class people middle middle class lower class blue collar that sort of thing 
Um, it's also, it, you know, I, I'm not going to pretend to be incredibly well versed in all of the different media in this in this area, but it's the kind. It's also a, a, a particular time and place that I don't see portrayed in a modern way a lot of times. Um, obviously, I've talked before about how mystery mystery media is a semi-dead genre or one that's having new revivals um but it waxes and wanes and with that comes um a lot of uh a lot of differences to the point of almost being incomparable in their even when they both fall when multiple things fall into the same genre um that the the content of their focus um, can be incredibly different. For example, I would say that the noir genre, while this could be considered borderline noir, noir is very much a genre that was produced in an earlier time and focused on often a later time. A lot of American uh, media, especially in the 20th century, was focused on stories that um, were surrounding, uh, let, uh, well, I, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush, but a lot of noir media has focuses on um, sort of the interwar or post-war America and what the society of that time looked like. And while this sort of falls into a similar place settings wise its attitude towards it is incredibly different um i find this also interesting because uh having never seen this before um the immediate comparisons that i want to that i i keyed in on to um the game la noir which i think i may only have one video on this channel about maybe two um but is uh impressive and very interesting and still a unique standout in the gaming industry um, is clearly very, very heavily inspired by this movie. Uh, and while it takes from other noir settings as well, um, I think thematically this movie is uh, uniquely comparable to L.A. Noir. Um, I don't know how much... Um, over, uh, how much admitted influence came was was you know how much influence was admitted by the producers of that game, but um, I think if you are into both games and movies and you like one, you'll like the other. That said, L.A. Noir being set in um, the you know post World War II period, more into the I don't actually know if it strays into the fifties, but the late forties. Or maybe it's the other way around. Anyway, um, being a slightly later period, it's still very much a period piece, but um, I realize I'm just straying into talking about L.A. Noir instead, which is not what I came here to do. So I'm just going to reset for a second um, and talk about Chinatown. I real There's a lot to like here, and obviously I've just spent a whole bunch of minutes talking about the uniqueness of its setting and production. I think I need to talk... Um, about the other aspects of the production as well, but let me get to the writing, I think, first. One, uh, this is a very, very good script. Um, I have talked before about how much I admire a script or a movie in general that is willing to just be quiet, sometimes for minutes at a time, and let the the visuals speak for themselves or the audio speak for itself and not have narrative at every given moment. I think this is especially necessary in a setting in a in a genre like a mystery um, or detective or noir, but I think it's applicable to all genres. And this is a movie that lingers very happily in moments of zero dialogue and just letting you take in and absorb the the world around uh, around you or around the character, and that really lends itself to an uh, uh, you know more than anything an investigation. 
when you're watching a movie that, um, as I've talked about before, needs to balance between showing you too much and not showing you enough so that you feel like you're in the loop, but you don't know everything before the, um, the characters in the movie do, uh, the ability to be quiet and not say anything or say just enough so that sometimes um, even the characters themselves get to remain mysterious. Even your focus character, your main character, um, gets to be, you know, sometimes sort of enigmatic. And that all leads to a, a really strong and confident feeling tone where it doesn't feel like it's trying too hard to engage you. Sometimes even good films um, in this kind of genre area, even when they're well balanced, even when they're giving you just enough, still feel like they are actively trying to engage you at all times. And that is something you don't think about, I think, that much, or I don't think about that much until I notice its absence. And because this is, I, I think that is in part um, a either, it's either an assumption or a reality about more modern audiences that the more modern your, or the newer your movie is, the more likely you are to have, even when it's paced well, for it to be constantly engaging you. Um, I cannot think of a movie that I've watched recently or in the recent past that uh, is recently made and also takes its time and is willing to stop engaging you at all times. I was actually thinking about um, the Knives Out movies, and those are movies that do, unfortunately, um, commit that sin. Now, I don't think it necessarily hurts them because they are engaging in a very different sort of way, but that's part of their modernization. Part of the modernization of the genre, uh, for better or for worse, has been to keep them constantly engaging. Um, and this is a movie that doesn't do that. Uh, it takes its time, it doesn't waste your time, but it also doesn't tell you everything. It expects you to be engaged with what is on screen, even if it's absent one of your, one of your normal um, cinematic senses, um, and uh, takes a lot of different twists and turns that are completely understandable, but not predictable. Um, I think that, how, how do I want to do this in a roundabout way? I guess I need to talk about the, the characters themselves and the actors who play them. I think a lot of the actors in this movie are just okay. And Jack Nicholson is a guy who has more range than some, but still, to me, falls into that same category of basically playing variations on Jack Nicholson. Um, so this, to me, just kind of looks like it's being played by Jack Nicholson. A lot of the other um, people in the film, while putting on good performances, are not particularly extraordinary. Um, they are very suitable, though. What really does stand out, though, is that the the writing carries a lot of that further than it otherwise would. The the willingness, uh, both the direction in the pacing and and all the visuals and the audio, that all helps a lot. But having a a script that also is willing to omit things and is allow, is is willing to write characters who. Uh, lie or omit things or tell half truths or um, are don't don't really stray into being like unreliable narrator kind of thing, but um, don't feel compelled to tell the the audience the whole story. That's really engaging, um, and it makes you continue wondering things even if you feel like you have all of the information 
or at the times when you don't feel like you have enough. It rides a very, very fine line of being able to do, to give you too much, not enough, and just enough, and all three Mo- all three types of moments still feel compelling. Um, I think it is hard to separate this movie from its um, historical setting, from being a period piece as well, uh, and it deserves credit for um, certain elements that make it seem um, a- appropriately set for the time. The uh, America in the 30s is not a, uh, admittedly, a an aesthetic that I have a really good grasp on exactly what it should look like. There are certain things that do stand out, elements of um, the costuming that uh, seem to be, you know, relatively appropriate cuts of the suits, um, th- you know, accessories that people are wearing, and of course, um, the... the uh, the cars are very notable in this film. Um, and I, I'm impressed at the the cars that they were able to um, either have or build, um, since some of them even get destroyed, um, for this film. Uh, it's very... It, it's, it adds to the immersion in a way that I think de- deserves noting, even if it's not, like, crazy extraordinary. Um, the... The sound, the sound is really well done. This has a good mix. Uh, the mixing is particularly important, I think, um, in in that it is willing to be very quiet at times to the point where you might get like if you're expecting a certain kind of more modern artistic production, there are moments that are too a little bit too quiet and they're done on purpose. Um, and there are also things that are like shockingly loud and to a, a more modern audience might seem excessively jarring and might, you know, but in the in the setting, I think are kind of perfect in um, how explosive they can be, how the dyna- the audio dynamics um, affect your emotional state and make it pair really well with the state of the characters on screen. Um, The music, while most often kind of unobtrusive and not that noticeable, is when you focus on it, really well done. uh, And I think it deserves deserves a shout out for that. Um, Excuse me. and overall, I think the cinematography is very good. This is an interesting thing production-wise. I actually didn't, when I pulled it up, I didn't uh, look at what year this came out. And I don't know if this got a, a um, maybe it got a re-digitization or something like that more recently. But if you asked me to guess what year this was made, I would have said it was probably the 80s. Um, and probably the late 80s, not because of anything in particular other than the sheer quality of the um, the light and sa- or the, the the lighting in the film quality itself um, is pretty extraordinary. Often, I feel like I can identify, um, the years that a movie was made purely based on some technical aspects of uh, like meta technical aspects of the cinema even if it's just like that particular film grain or the way that they were able or unable to light this scene or something like that sometimes those are things that can tip you off Um, and this looks like a more modern movie than than 74 to me Um, that's just kind of random opinion though um uh, it's directed by roman polanski who uh, (laughs) we're just not gonna touch that um but it is really well produced overall and won a lot of awards and i think rightly so um 
a connection I also didn't realize, although as soon as I, I was, I, and as soon as I saw it, it made perfect sense, was that this movie actually has a sequel. A sequel that, in fact, is also on my list, but did not know was the sequel. Um, the Two Jakes, uh, which actually came up in conversation just a few weeks ago. Um, for me, that is. Uh, and... I don't know how I didn't realize the two of them were connected. It re, re, um, uh, recasts uh, Jack Nicholson as the lead actor in this sort of mystery thing. Um, and so that's being bumped up on my list of uh, um, things to watch. I don't know. I don't know if the pro how much of the production was, um, you know, continuation for that movie, but... Um, yeah, that that movie has been uh, also has had a less vocal um, or less less uh, broad. Um, uh, I, I've heard le from less people that it's really good, but um, has come up from time to time, uh, though it's a much smaller name than Chinatown. Um, I think just even mentioning this even though i'm not saying anything specific about it could be constituted as a spoiler but um i'm just going to say that the course of the film and the way that it concludes is so truly unique uh and impressive in that right that i'm honestly still kind of uh stunned by it um it's not completely it, everything about it makes perfect sense. It's really, really well produced. It's just not, it is at times not what I expected. And I mean that in a positive way. Um, I think this movie's pretty extraordinary. And it's one that I will definitely have to come back to and re refer to as I continue my sort of broad exploration of the genre, um, since it's, you know, one of my growing favorites. Uh, you know, the influence that it had on cinema in general and other media in general, I think, is um, not to be underestimated. Uh, and it's going to give me a lot to think about for a long time, I think. Anyway, I think it's extraordinary. Um, and if you like the genre, you should check it out. No question. Anyway, thank you guys for watching another episode of Solipsis Watched. I've been your host, the Social Solipsist, and I'll see you guys next time.